Hey, hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday and welcome to the final bar. Today, we're going to talk about the S&P 500, another nice update. Just 5% or so below all-time highs after this recent run. Dana Lyons of J. Lyons Fund Management is going to share with us a couple alternatives to being long, large-cap growth stocks here in the U.S. and two FANG stocks reporting earnings after the close. Do we see further upside in these stocks, yes or no? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the action in the markets using the Technical Analysis Toolkit. Technical Analysis was really created to empower investors to have an edge, to have any sort of chance of competing in the uh, financial markets and having uh, the ability to make better decisions based on analyzing price over time. That toolkit has evolved, but a lot of the basic fundamental principles of the technical toolkit have really remained fairly uh, steady. We're gonna talk a little later about new Dow theory, which is really inspired by Charles Dow's original work in the late 1800s, early 1900s, adapting that to the modern age. But we'll talk about what is driving this market higher and what signs we may be looking for to anticipate when the uh, trends are reversing uh, lower. We had a really fun time, by the way, earlier today in our live Q&A on YouTube. If you missed it, make sure you uh, look at it on our YouTube channel. We'll do more of those here in the coming weeks and months. But for today, let's continue on with the final bar and uh, get to our market recap. What happened today? How can we connect the short term to the long term? First off, let's talk about a poll. We asked you a little topical question with Tesla coming up in the, uh, in the news today. Where is Tesla one month from today, in your opinion? At least 10% higher, at least 10% lower, or within 10% of current levels? Pretty even spread between these two. And that's actually a really interesting takeaway first off is, you know, it's, it's, it's actually tough to, to think about that sort of question. I think we got a, a variety of viewpoints represented here. I feel like there are all sorts of reasons why you could see Tesla and charts that have been working to continue to work. And the idea of it going 10% higher doesn't seem that unreasonable when you look at the trend and how quickly and what the pace of that trend has been. That's not too far off. At least 10% lower in one month is not unheard of. And, and if we actually do get that long-awaited pullback we really haven't seen yet, that would certainly be a, be a possibility. Within 10%, if I had to vote, I would probably pick that middle one within 10% only because I think there's a lot of choppiness to be had. I think if you do see a bit of a pullback, a little bit of retracement, you could see names like Tesla being more volatile, being more sideways, and sort of taking a pause from that directional movement. Remember, uh, markets can correct in terms of price and or time. And maybe it's more of a time correction with charts like Tesla. I think we'll find out a lot uh, after the close here in the after hour session. We have those initial reactions to Tesla reporting earnings. Thanks for answering that poll question, by the way. And don't forget to follow us on social media accounts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You won't miss the next poll question. Let's look at what the markets did today using the uh, market dashboard on stock charts, the S&P 500 up about a quarter of a percent. I mentioned with another nice sort of gentle update, not too much, about a quarter of a percent to 45.65, 45.66. We're now just about five, five and a half percent below all time highs. That's not too far away when you think about the pace of the trend in 2023. Uh, it's interesting. I, I had a, a number of conversations in the last 24 hours and um, uh, Jeff Hirsch of the Stock Traders Almanac made the point that, look, I know the trends are good, but the seasonality is not attractive here over the next couple months. And he is 100 percent right. In an average year, we're in the seasonally weaker period between May and October. In a pre-election year, which is what 2023 is, you usually have a strong first half of the year and a particularly weak second half of the year. And what's interesting is Talking with Jeff off and on over the last, uh, you know, for a while, but certainly focused on the seasonal trends in the last year, we talked going into October about the uh, likelihood of an October low based on the traditional uh, mid-year, uh, uh, mid-election year uh, uh, seasonal trends. That played out pretty well. The strength in the first half of the year has played out magnificently. Now we have a weaker second half of the year according to the average seasonal trends. We just haven't seen the market react to that and push lower yet, but that's certainly something in the back of my mind as I'm watching these charts continue to press to the upside. 
The Nasdaq composite really flat for the day. And if you look down, the only red that you see on this front page is the Nasdaq 100. The biggest names in the Nasdaq actually down, but again, just barely, right? Just 0.1%. But overall, everything else uh, doing just fine. Mid caps and small caps, decent update. Not a huge uh, update in the small cap. S&P 600 was up 0.6%. The VIX, uh, if you look at the bottom here, up another uh, half a point here to 1379. What's interesting is we've seen this trend now of stronger prices, lower volatility, which is sort of that slow and steady uptrend. If you look back over the last 20 years, you'll find a number of years like the first half of 2023. You have higher highs, higher lows, minimal drawdowns, low volatility. That's the trend. That's the condition that we're in, which tells me to be actively looking for signs that that trend is changing. Things that come to mind are breadth indicators, which are becoming pretty overheated. We'll look a little later. I think one of our three and three charts hits on a key breadth indicator to maybe pay attention to. Let's continue on looking at some other asset classes. The fixed income markets, for the most part, bond prices moving higher today. You can see the yield curve all in the red. That's the top four uh, levels from the long bond uh, here down to the short end of the curve. The 10-year point where we usually focus on down around 374. So continuing to uh, pull back a bit. And, and what's interesting is bonds rallying as stocks are rallying, both of them going up, but over time, if you look at the longer term trend, it's been stocks over bonds and it hasn't even been close. That trend has been fairly persistent. And I think that trend only changes if and when we get some sort of major corrective sort of pattern, which would see risk assets come off. You could see some sort of flight to safety, but we're not seeing that yet. We're seeing everything kind of uh, go up together. Dollar index uh, up a bit, up about 0.4%. Looking at the commodity space, a little bit mixed, although gold prices hanging in sort of flat from yesterday. We highlighted, I think, on yesterday's show, or certainly earlier this week, the rotation we've seen higher in, uh, in gold prices. We had that trend channel uh, from the October low uh, in stocks up through the first uh, you know, quarter of the year. Then you saw it break down to the lower end of the channel in gold. Now you're seeing a rotation back to the upside. Nice bounce higher off of a key Fibonacci level, by the way. Silver prices up as well, 0.4% higher for the SLB. Copper prices and crude oil, actually, a couple of the few that were down. Finally, cryptocurrencies pushing back to the upside. Yesterday, we talked about sort of this, you know, um, lack of follow through, right? Bitcoin gets above 30,000 and then has pulled back. And that's happened a number of times here in recent months. Today, we're back above 30,000. Ether prices back above 1,900. So you're continuing to see plenty of volatility. We just haven't seen enough of that follow through. Once Bitcoin has hit 30,000, it certainly felt like a ceiling of sorts, right? This sort of resistance level, we keep bumping up. We never really get enough follow through to the upside if and when that happens. Certainly plenty of upside on the chart or certainly, uh, plenty of open space on the chart above current levels, but we have to get through that resistance level first. Finally, even though it was an up day, if you look at the uh, sector distributions, it was not an offensive day. And I don't mean offensive like it didn't, didn't, wasn't good, but more like often. There wasn't an offensive-oriented day. It was more defense over offense. The top three sectors today were real estate, consumer staples, and utilities, all up about 1.1%. 1, 1 Technology, materials, and industrials are the only three sectors that were down today. So while the continued up move is certainly encouraging if you're bullish, the fact that it was some of the most defensive sectors that were leading the way higher may, may make you want to put a pause on that extreme bullishness based on the uh, trends that we've seen play out today. The daily chart of the S&P 500, we again continue to reinforce the uptrend. The most bullish thing the market can do is go up, as we've mentioned many times. You're seeing that, you're seeing that uh, ongoing, right? Every week we seem to be pushing a little bit higher. Last major drawdown we had was in mid-June. It wasn't much from around 44.50. We'll call it to 43.25. That's not too much of a, of a move, 125 points or so. We went right back to those levels, pulled back, and then broke out. And the last week has really been higher highs every day. So again, that trend has persisted. The momentum has gone back to overbought. The S&P 500 overbought yet again. Really, I think, um, you know, invalidating that bearish momentum divergence we highlighted at the end of June. You're now seeing the resumption of the uptrend on stronger momentum. That's the sign of a healthy market uh, overall. Now, this is not to say that I think the S&P is going to the moon. I've had a number of comments in some way, in some uh, shape, sort of implying that. And I, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think there are plenty of reasons why this market is very much overextended based on price and momentum characteristics, based on breadth measures, which have become extreme. But the only thing that's not happening is the price is not really coming down. That's what you look for. You look for signs of that. I think for now, I'm seeing plenty of stocks and plenty of charts continuing to work. 
I wanted to highlight this chart here, a new Dow theory. Um, uh, you know, when you, when you talk about Charles Dow's original work, it was based on the industrials and the transports and whether those two charts were in agreement or those two, uh, you know, main pillars of the economy were in agreement. I think a modern take on that is looking at the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite, kind of representing the old economy and the new economy. Um, I have issues with this, which I'm, I'm actively trying to figure out, which, you know, the fact that bo in both indexes, you have the same mega cap stocks that have an outsized weight in those. Um, so, you know, maybe there's a better way to think about this relationship of different parts of the economy. But for now, I would say this traditional measure, this, this adaptation of Charles Dow's original measure continue to be strong. So what do you look for in this sort of environment? You look for what's called a non-confirmation. Look on the left side of this chart. November of 21 to January of 22, higher price for the S&P, uh, same period for the NASDAQ composite, lower highs. That's called a bearish non-confirmation where one of these indexes makes a new high, the other one does not. That's what I'd be looking for here. For now, you're not seeing that. You're seeing a confirmation, which is both of them making new highs. And we saw that in uh, January into February. You saw that again in uh, the end of May, early June. And we're seeing that continue for now. So that's what I would be looking for as a potential red flag, a potential warning sign on the subtrend. One of them not confirming, which would be a bearish non-confirmation. We're not seeing that just yet. Let's look at some of the individual names. Uh, we had talked about Tesla in the, uh, in the poll question today. And thanks again, all of you that uh, responded to that. You know, it's interesting when you look at the, uh, the chart of Tesla going into earnings today, you can see, you know, again, nice higher highs, higher lows over the last, uh, the last couple months, breaking above the 200-day moving average in May. And when that happens, a question I always just have in the back of my head, is there enough follow-through? We've now gotten to this key resistance level where the stock has failed before. Do we have enough momentum to push higher? And the answer has been yes, Tesla keeps going uh, going higher. The momentum, not perfect, right? It's not really uh, pushing much higher at this moment. It's just narrowly overbought. But overall, the trend is positive and the relative strength is certainly good. Uh, after hours today, there's a lot that can be uh, that can happen here. For now, it uh, looks like Tesla's right around 300, right, right around 296 or so. So we'll see what happens through the uh, through the report and through the end of the uh, end of the day today. But for now, sort of holding in on those gains that we had recently. Other key name to take a look at, of course, is Netflix. And as we look at this one, hold on, I'm going to bring up the after hours quotes over here just to take a look at it. So Netflix, you know, again, even a more constructive sort of pattern, right? This nice uptrend. We had a big pullback in February into March, sort of a six week period of coming back from there, a higher low around the 50 day in uh, late April, early May. Now round tripping back, uh, eclipsing those previous highs. Most recent pullback was just around 405 and now bro uh, rotating higher. After hours here again, Netflix is another one reporting today. It's currently around 460, so down about 3, 4%, 3.5% uh, or so. So we'll see how things play out. What's interesting about a chart like Netflix is you can pull back to around 405, 410. That would be the low from June. That would be the 50 day moving average. You hold that on any sort of negative uh, news here, any negative reaction to earnings. And this is still a pretty solid chart. You start breaking the 50-day, you start breaking that recent swing low, that's when things can look a lot less ideal and start to you have to start to think about further uh, retrenchment to the downside and what that might look like. But for now, uh, plenty of room to, to pull back and still be within uh, a pretty, uh, pretty healthy uptrend. UAL, United Airlines, another one. I'm just going through some of the names reporting earnings today. We're sort of in the meat of earnings season, so it's always interesting to think about you know, the relationship between the technical and the fundamental. And just to be clear, uh, you know, I, I would say that if you really want to have a well-rounded approach, which I hope you do, and if you want to have a more holistic understanding of how the charts relate to other disciplines, I think it's important to think about the technical inputs during earnings week, right? When a company is reporting earnings, it doesn't mean that you should not look at the chart. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden it's all about earnings and nothing else. The chart tells you the conditions and the sentiment leading up into that earnings release. And I found a lot of times understanding the trend going into the release, seeing the reaction, the immediate reaction, and then what happens after that, sort of those three little periods to think about. So I would say the charts are really important right about now to see what sort of follow through or lack of follow through you can find uh, once you actually get the big uh, big earnings release. Uh, UAL is up about 3% in the after hours, just above 56.40, we'll call it, so sort of retesting these previous highs. Nice high or low around 53, and as long as we hold that in the short term, uh, certainly seems to be pretty pretty positive with the RSI you know, uh, recently pulling back to around 50, which is pretty encouraging. 
Las Vegas Sands is, is one more just to highlight today, reporting after the, uh, the close. It's down a bit in the after hours, around 5780, we'll call it, sort of down below the 50-day moving average. I think that could be a concern here. What concerns me about the chart of LBS, it, you know, I always think when you bring up a chart for the first time, what's your initial, rea like, re initial reaction? What's that first thing that jumps out at you? Then start to do a little more rigorous analysis and see what happens. The moment this chart comes up, I immediately think head and shoulders top even though it is not a completed pattern yet, but I'm immediately drawn to this right here, right? Take the rally off of the, uh, really bottomed in May, but major low in October. We rallied through the new year. You can see the pullback here in March, the higher high in uh, May, which creates the head, and then the right shoulder over here. This is actually what you call a complex head and shoulders, which is where you have a head and then multiple left shoulders, multiple right shoulders, all pretty stable. The neckline is the low in March connected to the low in May. We held that in July, and as long as that neckline holds, this isn't a bad chart. That neckline fails, and this all of a sudden suggests much further downside. And the general way you kind of do that is you take the height of the pattern, which is this, and then you sort of project that. So let's say we break down here. We break down through that head and shoulders topping pattern. That would be a downside objective, a minimum downside objective around 44. And that's based on the height of that pattern if it's completed, which it has not happened yet. But once you get below that neckline, that basically opens the door to that downside objective. So LVS, if, uh, you know, if we see a bit of a pullback after earnings uh, going through the rest of the week, that's a level that I think as long as that holds, things are still okay. But we break that and that opens up the door to a uh, pretty, pretty aggressive downside target for that stock. Just to finish off here, a couple names that were reported yesterday that I, uh, or before the open that I wanted to, uh, to highlight. Uh, Goldman Sachs uh, coming out. And again, if you, if you actually read uh, you know, a little more detail about uh, Goldman's earnings release, not a particularly strong you know, outlook. It's sort of a you know, negative thing. Business kind of uh, struggling a bit. Again, still uh, you know, bringing in quite a bit of revenues, but you know, really undercutting expectations, which had been withdrawn, had been tightened up quite, quite aggressively. Still up about 1%, even though it wasn't a particular particularly strong earn, uh, quarter, uh, according to, uh, to what I read. Uh, you know, a nice rally uh, today. And again, I think getting above that 345 level would take us above the May and June highs. We're sort of pulled up to that point and, uh, and holding. So I'd want to see if there's some follow through. A lot of financial stocks have started to do uh, better. Ally Bank is another one up over 5% today. So a nice follow through to the upside coming off of a higher low. So again, I keep coming back to financials when I'm looking for sectors and areas of the market that have been under-owned and underappreciated that are starting to show signs of life. Keep coming back to uh, some of the banks to see if we get upside follow-through beyond what we've seen so far. That's it for our market recap. A couple quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, Dana Lyons. First off, we're going to do a mailbag segment again very soon. We'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. We get so many great questions to the final bar mailbag. I would love to answer yours on our next uh, opportunity. Email is the best way to get your questions to us. The final bar at stockcharts.com is where to uh, get a hold of us. On Twitter, just tag us in a comment at final bar SCTV. On the YouTube, just drop a comment below the video you're watching. We would love to get your, uh, your question. Hope to answer yours in our next mailbag segment. Also to remind you, we have a summer sale happening right now at stockcharts.com. We have paid membership levels, which really bring the uh, platform to life, allow you to save custom charts with lots of different indicators, chart lists, so you can keep a watch lists and portfolios and different ideas grouped together in meaningful ways. Also our scan engine, which is a powerful way of identifying stocks and ETFs on the move with the particular technical signals and patterns that you think are most uh, appropriate. Go to stockcharts.com slash special. If you are a current subscriber, you can actually extend your membership at the current low level during the sale only. So go to stockcharts.com slash special to find more information. I'd encourage you to do it today. I want to welcome on today's guest, Dana Lyons. Dana is the uh, founder or partner at J Lyons Fund Management, also editor of the Lion Share Report coming to us from Chicago. Dana, it's great to see you again. How have you been? Okay. Yeah, I've been great. Thanks for having me on again, Dave. Happy summer. It's good to see you. I want to bring up your charts here because, you know, what, there's been such a discussion about large cap growth, sort of this dominance of a particular theme. And we've seen the S&P and the NASDAQ push higher. But there's certainly some indications that we could be overextended. The question is, what else could we be looking at? We're looking at your chart of the grains index. Why is this a potential opportunity here? Sure. Uh, and that's a good point. You know, the trend is certainly up still in large cap tech, and we want to ride that trend as long as it takes. 
Um, but there are, as we've discussed in the past, a lot of concerns about the background risk uh, in U.S. equities and the sustainability of any bull market in the, in the S&P and the large cap tech and U.S. equities in general. Just, to, just after such a long run, they're overowned, overvalued. Uh, so ride it while they last, uh, you know, while the trend lasts. But we want to have a look out, uh, keep our eyes out for other markets that might have more sustainable potential to the upside. And that includes international equities as well as other markets in general. And one of those markets is commodities, which uh, we feel started one of those long, uh, after a long quiet period, started a long term bull market. You know, around the, the COVID lows back in 2020, including the grain market, which had a nice run over the, couple, the last couple of years uh, into the 2022 top, has had a, a big retracement. Uh, in fact, that 61.8 Fibonacci retracement, very important um, uh, percentage retracement there, which also coincides if you look at the, uh, the lows in the 2021 period, kind of around the basing around the same period. So, uh, we think the next big up leg in uh, in commodities, uh, including grains, could be starting sometime this year. And we want to look for entry points. And this would be one of those entry points that we're seeing right now in the grain market, whether it's corn, grain, um, wheat, excuse me, or grains in general. This might be the opportunity to start accumulating a, a good position, good allocation for grains for potential for a um, major mean reversion from here and the start of the next big up leg there. When you see an opportunity like this, Dana, in something like grains, right, there's different ways to play it. You can go to the commodities market, futures market. You can, you know, ETFs, individual stocks that have that sort of exposure. How do you think about what levers to pull when you see an opportunity like this? And, and where, how would you actually try to play some uh, potential bounce in something like grains here? Sure. So obviously the futures would be the purest play. Uh, for our clients, we mostly uh, utilize ETFs or exchange traded funds for their portfolios. So right now we've been buying, uh, for example, DBA would be one broader uh, grain fund, as well as CORN, WEAT, uh, some more uh, specific um, ETFs specific to those each uh, those individual grains. So we've been accumulating some of uh, some of those. Um, uh, they're all a little bit different, but what I like about those, obviously those funds is they're specific to the commodity themselves. you know mm. if we get into a commodity bull market, it doesn't mean you know those companies that are leveraged to those those commodities are necessarily going to go with it. there's there's going to be upside influence for sure. But if yeah. equities are having a rough time, there might be downside pressure at the same time. So we want more of a pure commodity play. Uh, it's really well said. I appreciate you talking through those and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and very well done. Your next chart here to get to it is looking at, here we go, uh, Japan. And this is an interesting one. It's the DXJ, which is a hedged, a currency hedged uh, a Japan fund. Can you talk us through the, the chart of DXJ and what's compelling here? Sure. So, you know, unlike the U.S., which has been uh, hitting higher highs, obviously, for some time, Japan went through that, you know, the, the uh, obvious bear market, secular bear market, topped out in 1990, pretty much has been going sideways ever since. You know, we've had a nice run of bottoming attempt over the last decade. Um, but you can see even on the DXJ, which hedges out. The currency risk, though, so that the hedges out the um, downside in the Japanese yen uh, while it goes long the Japanese equities. So it kind of plays out or, or hedges out the currency risk. Even this one has gone sideways for the better part of two decades before just recently breaking out. So what, it, what we like about it is that unlike the U.S., especially the large cap tech, which has been moving upward for a long time, there's, it's got heavy ownership, uh, wide range ownership. It's overvalued. Something like Japan, especially this hedge equity ETF, it's not overowned. It's not overvalued. It's had this long flat period where kind of uh, uh, valuations come down and, and investor um, allocations kind of been 
run out of that because people have been frustrated uh, trying to play the Japanese market for so long and nothing mm. is, it hasn't paid off. So after a long flat period, uh, I think it's got a lot of fuel to move to the upside. And unlike the US, like I mentioned before, which we doubt the long-term sustainable uh, sustainability of this bull market, Japan has more of a, a potential for sustained upside, for sustained lower high or uh, higher highs and higher lows, that type of thing. So Japan would be one area we'd be looking for, maybe more of that sustainable potential for the upside. Yeah, that's really it's a great observation. And, and it's interesting when you look at non-US markets, um, Japan is one that kind of stands out as having a, a pretty compelling rotation. Can you just speak, you, you, you hit on this, just the, the currency hedge and what that means. When you're looking at Japan, what drives the decision to buy like the EWJ, which I know a lot of uh, investors are familiar with, versus the DXJ, which sort of you know, takes the currency out of the picture? What drives your decision as to what lever to pull there? Sure, really the chart, you know, yeah. and, and price. You know, we're, oh, when we're considering investment selection, we're looking at relative strength. So we want to be mm. uh, concentrated in those uh, funds, in those, in those markets, in those ETFs that are performing the best, especially on a risk adjusted basis. So right now, the DXJ is heavily outperforming EWJ, which is, is done well this year. But DXJ, as you can see, has, break, has broken out to all time highs where, EWJ is still lagging. And uh, that tells us there's something going on from a currency perspective um, mm. outside of specifically, you know, uh, examining and dissecting the currencies itself. It's already playing out in the prices of these equity ETFs. So for for us, what, what that's telling us is that there's going to be some sort of uh, 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 currency, some sort of yen weakness perhaps going forward mm. or some sort of hedging um uh hedging that that should be done if you're going to take advantage full advantage as a u.s investor of the, that move in japan so for us price is the most important guide in uh, deciding which way we're going to go so right now the xj is the way to go and uh, like i said the, the the price is giving us a, a tip off that okay maybe uh the currency market is going to uh, from maybe the yen is going to have difficulty going forward. And uh, usually the, the, the prices and, and markets in general are a better, you know, uh, weighing machine or discounting mechanism than any, you know, any type of analysis that we can do individually. So that price is telling us a lot here. Mm, oh, that's, that's a brilliant answer. You know, we mentioned in the market recap, obviously, the major averages pushing higher, the S&P and the Nasdaq continuing to make new highs for the year. On a day like today, it was more defensive sectors at the top of the list. So you talked about sort of skepticism about further upside for, for major equities, which I, I 100 percent get the get the argument for. What would you need to see to really turn more risk off in a portfolio? Is it improvement maybe beyond just one day, but further improvement from areas like utilities and staples, which have pretty much been underperforming? Or is it more the major averages just rolling over and, and showing that the uptrend is over? What would tell you to get more defensive in a portfolio you were running? Sure. So for us and our, our, our the models that we run are heavily geared towards breadth and market internal. So hmm. we want to see heavy participation from the broad swath of, uh, of stocks and market, not just heavily cap weighted averages like the NDX or the S&P 500. You know, uh, we have no problem being long those indices if they're going up, but if there's not broad participation uh, from the, the market general or the small and mid caps, uh, then, then we have doubts about the sustainability of that type of move. The interesting thing is um, heading into June, really there wasn't much broad participation at all. You had basically just the large cap tech, like you mentioned, uh, leading the way. So, like I said, you could be long that, but we didn't have a lot of uh, optimism um, from the broad market in general, from the internals, from the breadth that 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 we wanted to be very aggressive. That changed uh, about six weeks ago, yeah. around the end of May, early June, when breath started improving. You saw the broader averages starting to prove. We saw kind of a shift in relative strength from the large caps to the smaller mid caps. Um, something like the value line composite, which 
um, measures the median stock in the market. Going into June, it was actually down on the year. It gained about 67% in June and has kept going up in July. So it's, it's pushing double digits at this point. So for us, yes, the large caps extended. We do not want to be chasing that area of the market. You can buy it on pullbacks. But the broad strength that we've seen over the last six weeks to two months has been encouraging for us. Now, if that breaks down, then we want to start getting uh, getting uh, more defensive again. So that would be the tip off for us. Dana, this was awesome. I really appreciate you sharing some charts with us. Really made me think a little bit about some areas of the market we haven't talked about as much recently. Really appreciate it. Be well and stay safe there in uh, Chicago. Say hi to the Midwest for us, and we'll talk to you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Dave. That's Dana Lyons. Dana's a partner at J Lyons Fund Management, editor of the Lions Share Report. I really love when, when uh, Dana comes on the show. He brings long-term charts, really showing where we're at relative to where we've been. And a lot of times, he'll highlight some of these turns, some of these breakouts that are just, it's a great wake-up call to focus on areas of the market like Japan. Think about something like the DXJ, which is not an ETF I've looked at very often, and really think about the value proposition of some of these different structures and the timing of it. I can't disagree. It's funny, as we talk about the markets going upward and upper and upper, you know, how do you sort of, uh, you know, think about ways to, uh, to play a market that's very overextended? A couple ideas there from uh, Dana Lyons. Great take there, as always. And we have to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three. Three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. Dana Lyons, great take, and he was talking about uh, breadth, and I, I would totally agree with, uh, with him on, on the breadth conditions. Really have rotated higher uh, in the last you know, six to eight weeks. You've seen a dramatic improvement in some of the breadth conditions that were not as supportive of the uptrend uh, until just recently. I'm looking at the S&P 500, and then the percent of S&P stocks above their 200-day, the percent of S&P stocks above their 50-day. What I have to point out is a couple things. Number one, all of these are above 50%, which is bullish. Right? I mean, that's sort of the definition of a bullish, generally speaking, a bullish phase is when these are above 50. That means over half of the stocks in this group are above those moving averages. That's pretty encouraging. But the problem is when it keeps going up and up and up, eventually you start to get to some of the higher readings that you've seen. It doesn't theoretically mean we can't go all the way to 100%. But it's just pretty rare, and we're getting very close to the level we've been at when we've had some pullbacks. If you look, it's about 85% of the S&P 500 as of today's close above their 50-day moving average. The last times we've been this uh, high in the last year, November of last year, before the pullback into the end of, uh, end of the year, and the August peak before we rolled over. Go further to the left on the chart, though. And what I'm also noticing is in more of an extended bull phase, you can get up to around 90% and even go higher. The highest we've been here uh, in, uh, in the last five years is in June of 2020. We got almost to 97%, 98%. That was the beginning of a much further move to the upside. But in pretty much all of those cases, you did have a brief pullback. So that's what concerns me as we get these breadth uh, conditions becoming a little uh, more overheated over time. Chart number two, KLAC. As we've mentioned on the show and in, uh, in, in uh, articles and other, other stuff that I do, I would say your goal as a trend follower is basically to identify trends, to follow those trends, and to figure out when those trends or anticipate when those trends may be reversing. And to figure out when trends are in place, you look for breakouts, you look for stocks and ETFs above upward sloping moving averages, higher highs and higher lows, all those sort of phrases that tend to roll off my tongue many times every day on the final bar. That second half where you're anticipating an exhaustion point, you look for when that trend is going higher, but when the momentum starts to roll over. Same thing if you'd see the market go higher on weaker breadth. That tells you that something's starting to change. What it tells you is, even though the price is going up, something underneath the hood is starting to look a little wonky, looking a little different. You may want to revisit it. Now, this is a pattern that we highlighted on charts like Amazon, and they pulled back but now have continued and overall have resumed their uptrends. KLAC, a large cap name in the semiconductor space, uh, really displaying a, a pretty classic bearish momentum divergence. Higher highs in mid-June, late June, and mid-July. Uh, lower peaks in momentum every one of those times. Signs like that tell me to be skeptical a further upside, at the very least, expect some sort of pullback. The 50-day is right around previous price support, around 450. I could see downside there, then revisit and see where we're at. Finally, AT&T, yet another earnings name. This, again, this is a meet of earnings season in a 30-minute show. We only have so many of these charts we can review, but I like to hit on as many as I can. Uh, AT&T up about 8.5% today. Nice bounce off of the lows. What's really interesting, though, 
is yesterday's candle pattern. Very quickly, do you know what that candle pattern is? Three, two, one. It's called an inverted hammer. If you said shooting star, that's really close. If that pattern had happened up here during an uptrend, you'd call it a shooting star candle, right? Think of something shooting down from the sky. When it's at a bottom, think of it as hammering out a bottom. And if it's a, you know, the open and close at the top and a long lower shadow, that would be a hammer candle. This is called an inverted ha uh, hammer. It's basically just flipped around. It's a reversal candle telling you a short-term bounce. What's interesting is look left on the chart and look at the low in October of last year. You have a bullish engulfing pattern. So AT&T now a number of times has had these real classic candle patterns signifying a bottom. The fact that we saw that inverted hammer yesterday as we were testing the lows from October of last year, really indicating a, a bounce to the upside is likely today, up about 8.5%. Folks, that's our wrap for this show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Thanks to all of you that joined us for our live Q&A earlier today on YouTube. We'll do another one in two weeks or so. We'll pour, uh, pop another one on the... Thanks again for uh, Dana Lyons from J Lyons Fund Management joining us from Chicago. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, see you tomorrow.